I want to talk to you a little bit about right before Jesus was hung on the cross. Just before he was hung on the cross, um, first there was the um, Sanhedrin, who the, the religious groups, the council and the chief priest and all these got together. And at first, they integrated Jesus. In fact, they slapped him around a little bit, um, beat him up a little bit, tried to get him to um, admit to sinfulness, doing stuff wrong. And they just, there was nothing that they could charge him with. So they started making up some things, saying, I will destroy the temple in three days and rebuild it. He never said he would destroy the temple. He did say he would rebuild it if it was destroyed. He was talking about himself. After he is destroyed, after they hang him on that cross, after they place him in the grave, in three days he will rise again. That's what he was talking about. But they use that to say, oh, he's trying to have his own kingdom. He's trying to be a king. So then once they had enough of what they believed would be a great case for Pilate, they took him to Pilate. And he stood before Pilate. And Pilate would ask him, who are you? What's your story? In fact, in Matthew 27, starting at verse 11, it says, Now Jesus stood before the governor, that's Pilate, and the governor questioned him, saying, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, it is as you say. Jesus did not deny the truth. And while he was being accused by the chief priest and the elders, there's the, the other ones that's there, the chief priests and the ones that um, all these religious crazy people that were out there trying to accuse Jesus of um, all kinds of lies. As the chief priests and the elders were accusing him, Jesus would not answer. He would not reply. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? And he did not answer him with regard to even a single charge. This made Pilate amazed. He's like, You won't answer these questions? He goes, Most people that come in here are angry and they're ready to charge back and say I didn't do that I didn't do that but Jesus just allows them to make their case and he doesn't even give a response to their accusations they accused him enough that even Pilate was confused about the situation amazed at Jesus his demeanor and his character Man, he's never seen anybody like this before. Now at the feast, the, gov the governor was accustomed to release for the people any one prisoner whom they wanted. And what, this is usually what would happen is um, at this feast, just to make the Jewish people happy and to say the Roman government is with you and we're here to help you, they usually would release a political figure that they had captive. They would usually release them just as a good gesture. So what would happen is um, Pilate, not unable to make the distinction between what, uh, what was he going to do with Jesus, was he going to have him hung on a cross or release him, he now, it, under the pressure, he's now going to ask the people. So at the time, um, they were holding a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For most of you, if you say, why would he say Jesus, who is called Christ? Is he trying to rub it in? Is he trying to make a bigger case for him? The reason that um, is most likely why he clarified that is because um, Barabbas, if you read in other translation, translations, either his first, last, middle name. Anyway, um, he also has the name Jesus in his name, which is kind of ironic, I believe. But um, that there's two Jesuses here, on, uh, and one of them's going to be released. But Barabbas also, as one of his names, is called Jesus. So I think Pilate was, if people knew this man as Jesus, he wanted to make it clear, which one are you talking about? Barabbas, um, uh, I think it's Bar-Jesus, or Jesus, um, however they pronounce it, or Jesus um, the one who's called Christ. 
So, for he knew that because of the envy, they had brought him over. Pilate wasn't stupid. He knew what was going on. He could see that the Jewish people had built this case. He saw what they were doing, but there's a political issue going on. Pilate's been um, governor for years, and he, you know he's got to look good. And he definitely doesn't want a case going back to Caesar and saying how he's, uh, he's not helping the Jewish people. He doesn't want any trouble. So he's in a bind of there's this man that's on trial here. There's a group of people who are trying to condemn him. He hasn't done anything wrong. But at the same time, if it releases him, this case is going to Caesar. And um, Pilate, he knows these people are going to make him look really bad. While, it, while Pilate... This is verse 19. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, he's sitting there to make a case for Jesus. He's trying to figure out what is going on, what he should rule. His wife is the only person that's noted in the Bible for standing up for Jesus Christ. Vocally. There's other people that probably believed it. But there's only one person that voiced their opinion, and that's his wife. There's stories outside of the Bible that says that she either was a believer or became a believer because there was a healing um, that took place on a child, and they believe that was her child that was healed. But biblically, we can't prove that, but there is a story um, in his, history books that you can read. And if that's true, that's wonderful. If not, what we have by the Bible is that she stood up for Jesus. She stood up for Jesus and she said, the Bible says, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message saying, have nothing to do with that righteous man. For last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. She knew what was going on was wrong. But she's the only one that stood up for Christ. What about all those people that were healed for those three years? In a half years that Jesus was walking here on earth. What about the people that came out to hear him speak? Loved him. How about all the 5,000, 10,000 or more people that were fed miraculously? Where were they? They were all quieted down because most likely in fear of what the chief priest and the elders would do to him. If you go back in chapter 27, I noticed a few things that happens right before the crucifixion. All the way up to the crucifixion. First of all, I notice that Judas is the one of the disciples that betrayed Jesus. He's the one that brought the enemy to Jesus for just a few coins, a, few, a little bit of silver. He sold Jesus out. After he saw that the chief priest and the high priest and the, rest of the elders were condemning Jesus, all of a sudden the guilt began to overcome him. He went back to the chief priest. It says, then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. What kind of blood? Innocent blood. Do you know that the Bible, um, continually through God's word, Old Testament all the way through the New Testament, it is mentioned over and over the innocence of Jesus Christ. It is prophesied in the Old Testament, and it is revealed in the New Testament. He was innocent of sin, of doing wrong. Judas, right here in, in his own words, says, I betrayed innocent blood. Pilate's wife, following down, is the one that sent the message to Pilate, saying, have nothing to do with this righteous Righteous, innocent, done nothing wrong, man. It was that witness to say, this man's innocent. 
the Bible over and over has let us know that the person that went to the cross was not guilty of anything. Pilate, had he not been so scared, had he not been caught up in the politics, he probably would have listened to his wife. He probably would have went through with his own words where he said, I found nothing to condemn this man. In verse 22, Pilate said to them, What shall I do with Jesus? There's sermons about that, the wording of that. It should just hit your heart so hard. As Pilate says, because he can't, he can't find anything wrong with Jesus. He's innocent. He even says this. He even says, I haven't found anything to condemn him. Herod hasn't found anything to condemn him. What, what's he saying? This man is innocent. What do you want me to do with Jesus? They all cru cried out, crucify him. They all wanted Jesus put to death. All of these people, they're saying crucify Jesus, but listen to, listen to his past. He healed, healed the sick, the blind to see, the lame to walk, the deaf to hear. He's given hope to the hopeless. He's raised the dead. Preach the good news. He's loved the unlovable. The ones that the communities have turned against. The ones the communities have cast out into the tombs. He befriended. He loved. He had compassion for. Luke 20 verse 4 says Pilate goes to the chief priest I find no guilt in this man when the when the soldiers took him and they beat him and I, I don't like going through the gruesomeness of the beatings because we all know how bad it was But I do want you to understand this. That God took your place. So when you hear the story of the crown of thorns being placed over his head. The mockery from King Herod to the, um, to the Jewish leaders to the Roman soldiers. When you hear of how they spit on him and how they beat him. The book of Isaiah says that he was beaten so bad that he was unrecognizable. Even as a human. That means if you saw him you wouldn't know who he was. If you've ever seen someone be beaten. And if you watch the news you can probably see that a lot. Their eyes go shut, they swell, their face swells up and shut. As Pilate had said, I found no guilt. Well, there's another way that the Roman soldiers can take you and they, they take you to a post and they, uh, they tie your wrists together and your legs together and you're stumped over this post and then they, they take a whip out which has um, bones um, in um, wrapped in it, has metal, um, lead in there and... Um, all kinds of like rocks or stones placed in there so that when it goes across the prisoner's back, it rips it. 
it rips it deep. Well, the, there's a purpose for this by the Romans. For one, they're going to show everybody, hey, you do something wrong, this is how you're going to, this is what you're going to get. There's a, a, a mercy clause that they have. A prisoner is to get 40 stripes and no more than 40. Because they believe after 40 that it'll kill you. As if any less than that won't. But they have a mercy rule. That they won't give you 40 stripes. They'll only give you 39. So that's the maximum they're, by law we're supposed to do it. Because one's for mercy. I'm glad that God's mercy is a lot greater than the Roman mercy. The soldiers would slap that whip across your back and pull it and rip and rip the skin. There's a reason besides showing the people. The other one was, was that if there's any crimes that you've committed, if you confess those crimes while they're beating you, they will begin to lighten the whippings, the scourging. If you don't confess your crimes out loud. Then they continue with even stronger beatings. Jesus didn't confess any sins, any wrongdoings, because he was innocent, even with his own acknowledgement. If Jesus wasn't for real, there is a Roman scribe of sorts. As the beating is taking place, the prisoner is bound to that stump. And the, the whip is coming down and ripping the back apart. Any of the words coming out that confessing to crimes, that scribe is writing them down. The tablet was empty for any crimes against Jesus Christ. Otherwise, they would have brought them out and revealed them, saying, this is why. Except for there was one letter. And Pilate acknowledged it. He confessed that he was the king of the Jews. But Pilate knew it was even greater than that. And he didn't even put the word confessed on there. He is the king of the Jews. That's his crime, is being our savior. Being the one to rescue us. Being our king. He's more than our king. He's our creator. But he died on that cross because of his love that he had for us. But not only is he being beaten, did his own acknowledgement that he had no sin, he was innocent of any crimes. But when he was up on that cross, the, thief, the thieves began to talk about it and joke about Jesus being up there. Well, if you're Christ, then go ahead, get yourself down. And then finally, one of them got, came to the senses. He finally said, wait a minute, we're up here for the crimes that we've done. But this man is up here, and he's innocent. It says this, the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. It's what a love that Jesus has, even as he has suffered. Man, he could have turned to that guy and said, I don't want anything to do with you people. Look at all the things that they've done to me. No, nope. he said, in all confidence, he said, today you will be with me in paradise. Let me tell you something. 
If Jesus wasn't for real, he would have confessed it as they were beating him. If Jesus wasn't for real, he would have confessed it as he was hanging on that cross to that man. said, man, I, I don't know about all this stuff. No, Jesus was for real, and he knew it. And he knew what he had to do to pay the price. In Matthew 27, the chief priest standing around and Jesus cried out to God. And they started making fun of him, mocking him. His mouth was dry and he wanted something to drink. And among them, the chief priest, and they began to say, wait, 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 wait. He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe in him. Listen to what the chief priest said immediately before he said, let him come down. The first thing he says is he saved others. The chief priest has watched Jesus go through the town, raise the dead, heal the sick, the lame to walk, the deaf to hear, the blind to see. He has witnessed all of this, yet he is sitting here and mocking him, making fun of him, even though he is fulfilling all of the Old Testament prophecies. The chief priest is mocking our Lord and Savior at the same time admitting that Jesus is who he says he is. He saved others. What do you mean he saved others? If you are telling me that he saved others, why in the world don't you believe in him? But he never thought of that. And then he says, he cannot save himself. It's the one truth besides the first truth. So it's the second truth. It's the second truth that I heard come out of the chief priest's mouth, or read that came out of the chief priest's mouth. First, he has saved others. Absolutely true. The chief priest has Jesus pegged on this issue. He definitely has saved others. We have read the scripture. There are witnesses to it. These things are accurate and true. The second thing that he says right after that is he cannot save himself. Absolutely true. And all the church people are going, huh? Huh? No, he's God. He can save himself. No, he's God. He can save himself. Jesus is God. He can save himself. Yes, he can. But if he does, if Jesus comes off of that cross, we all die. If Jesus does not fulfill the death and resurrection, if he says, while he's up there, I've had enough. He's already told the disciples he can call legions of angels. To come and rescue him at any moment. He doesn't need us to go and back him up. <laughs> he says, I got all the power that I need. The chief priest had it right. Jesus cannot come off of that cross because he loves us so much that he is not going to come off that cross until he has paid the price that God has sees as ransom. For each and every one of us to have eternal life in heaven with him. Chief priest didn't understand it when he said it. He definitely didn't have the right intentions when he said it. But boy, did he have Jesus pegged because the love that Jesus has for each and every one of us. It's because of his love he was not going to move from that cross until he said it is finished. Game over. We've won. And sure enough, he died on that cross, was placed into a grave, guarded by Roman soldiers. Saturday must have been a terrible day for the apostles, the disciples, because and the believers, 
because there was that day of silence. They didn't know what to do next. Had they listened to the, what Jesus had been teaching, had they listened to what Jesus had been teaching, had they listened to what Jesus had been teaching for those years that Jesus was walking with them, he said it over and over, I'm going to rise up on the third day. I'm going to rise up on the third day. Why didn't they hear that? And it was a glorious day when Jesus revealed himself to the disciples, the apostles, the believers in Galilee. I just want to take this moment because I, 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 I don't like how some churches just, they place women in a different place. And I know the sermon's not about this, but I mean, this is that one time that I want to make this clear. There's a lot of churches, a lot of believers who believe well, and this is not a heaven or hell issue. This is just an issue on believers in Christ and how each one of us is treated. Um, a lot of churches will not allow women to preach. They won't allow women to teach men. And I know there's some scripture that they can back it up with, but I'll, I'll tell you, here's a, here's a scripture that trumps all other scriptures to me. Because I, I can't always understand, like, um, I, I know that there's a place where Paul says not to, or the women shouldn't teach um, a man, um, but there's some reasoning for that. Um, that. I think that was for a general, that wasn't for everybody. Um, it, he goes to different towns and teaches. And, and also he said that's his opinion, he did say that. But no matter what you believe about if women can preach the gospel or re women cannot preach the gospel, this is the one place that if you read this, the angels of God told the women to go and tell the men the first gospel message ever preached was preached by women. He said, go and tell the men that Jesus is risen from the dead, the tomb is empty. Now, Jesus met them as they're walking down the trail, going back, man. They're, they're, they're running. They're ready to get back, and Jesus stops them. Now, if Jesus was totally against this, if Jesus was sitting there and said, ooh, women aren't supposed to give this message. You guys really messed up. What'd you give it to the women for? Jesus would have stopped them and said, oh, no, you can't give this message. Women aren't allowed to do this. No. You know what Jesus said? Jesus says, go and tell them that, and also tell them I'm going to meet them in Galilee. He added more to it. Not only did the angels tell the women to go tell the men, he all, Jesus also said, go tell the men and tell them where I'm going to meet them. Who are we as churches today to tell women that um, they can't preach the gospel, especially to men? And, and, and Satan would love us to say that because there are more women on this planet than men. So if you can cut out the women, boy, you just took out a majority of the people who could spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. So why in the world would Jesus tell women not to go and spread the gospel? Like I said, that's not today's sermon. Man, if you take nothing else away from here, women, get up and start spreading the gospel. Start preaching. Start just, don't let anybody tell you that you can't talk about Jesus Christ and the good news of the resurrection and the hope that he has given us through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Man, go out there and spread the good news. And if anybody tells you not to, send them to Jesus and say, hey, you go to Jesus, you deal with it. Where do you go from there? We go back to those wonderful words of Pilate. Those words of Pilate said this. He said, so what do I do with Jesus? I want, to, I want you to, not even, not even anything that I want you to do. It's what you have to do. From the day that you were born to the day that you die, you are the judge you are Pilate. You are sitting on the judgment seat of, for Jesus Christ. Jesus is around you. Jesus, you have seen and heard the testimony of the people that have told you about Jesus Christ. From the day that you're born to the day that you die, the only, only thing that you must do, you must do this, is what Pilate has to deal with 
in his own words. What am I going to do with Jesus? Because it doesn't matter how much money you make, what you did with your job, what you did with your kids, what you did with your wife, why you spent your family life, how you spent your fun time, all of that is going to go away. The only thing that's going to be asked when you leave this earth and judgment day comes is what did you do with Jesus in your life? You be the judge of Jesus. And it's kind of ironic, but it's a twist. It's Pilate. Pilate was able to judge Jesus and condemn him to death. Pilate was given the authority to do that. But you do realize this, that Pilate condemned Jesus or had him um, executed, gave him the judgment and the call and slammed the hammer down. Yes, he's going to be crucified. But you know, it didn't change Jesus. It changed Pilate. Jesus is still who he is, who he was, who he's always going to be. Jesus is Lord and Savior no matter what call you make. Pilate did not change Jesus. Pilate changed himself. Jesus does not send you to hell. Jesus does not do that. Throughout your life, you are the judge on what you believe about Jesus. You can read the Bible. You can hear the stories. You can experience the proof in your own life by um, asking Christ in your life and seeing the proofs that he does within you. There is proof all around. There is a case that can be made for Jesus' existence. There's also a case that can be made in his not existence because there's people out there trying to make that case. And you can see they went before Pilate and they said, he's not who he says he is. He's doing this, he's doing that. You know that even in their own words, they confess that Jesus saved others. So you have to be the judge for Jesus. But understand this, when you, when you decide if Jesus is God or if he's not, if he's the savior of your life or if he's not, if you decide that he's, he exists or he doesn't exist, if he's the creator or if he's not the creator, whatever you decide does not change him, it changes you. You are either destined for heaven or hell and it's your judgment call. Based on all the evidence in your life that you have worked with, you've seen all the uh, proof that you need to either sway you to believe him or not believe him. However, you can also be that person that believes like Pilate did. Pilate said, "I, I don't see, he's innocent. I don't see any guilt in this man. What is Pilate saying? I believe this guy. I believe him. but he still let him go and die on the cross. You can sit in this church today, and you can say, I believe in Jesus. Man, he's a good man. But if you do not ask him, the Bible says that if you confess that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. What does it mean you have to do? You need to stand up and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord of your life. You must believe in Jesus Christ. You must believe he is God. Don't let other people tell you differently. He is not just a prophet. He is a prophet. (laughs) But he is God. And if you do not confess that Jesus is Lord, that's a capital L in the Bible. When you read it, it's a capital L. One is that it's translated from meaning God. He is not little L like a Lord, like a a servant and a, a Lord would be like here on earth. No, he's capital L. He's God. And if you do not confess that he is God of your life, if you do not confess that you are a sinner and that you have done some really bad things and the only way that to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ, if you do not confess with your mouth that Jesus is God of your life and he has forgiven you because you've asked for forgiveness, if you don't repent, it's all compacted in the word believe if you believe in jesus christ you believe all of this this is this is just expounding on what the word believe means it means i believe what jesus has said and i believe what he taught i believe what he's all about what does he mean he he hates sin how much does he hate sin he gave his life so that you can be freed from it that's how much he hates it if you see all the evidence and you still turn away It doesn't change Jesus, it changes you. What will you do about Jesus 
The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Me being a pastor, I can't let you get out of here without asking you, is today the day of salvation for you? I am not going to guilt you into it. It, it, it. Guilt, salvation doesn't work. You'll be guilty until you go outside and your friends start hanging out with you and you start hanging out with them and you're like, oh yeah, everything's back to normal now. I don't feel guilty at all. No, the reason that people get saved and they commit to it is because they realize that Jesus is the answer and he's the only way to heaven and I want that because I don't want to go to hell and you can, oh, don't scare me with that hell stuff either. You know what? There is heaven and there is hell. No scaring about it. You either want it or you don't. But what you do with Jesus determines your destiny after you leave this earth, and it's for eternity. If you all stand, I don't need any music or anything. Um, I, 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 I don't want to dramatize it. I don't want to, um, I just, you know what? I've seen a lot of people come to the altar. <laughs> if you count how many people have come to our altars or our events. It's about 3,000 people have came to accept Christ in their life through this little small ministry. But the problem that I deal with every day is how many come down and really commit to God and say, God, I've looked at the, I, I, I've looked at the Bible and I've read it and then I've also compared it to my friends and what they've said and, and, and I've seen it and how many people really come down and say, but God, I, I know you're real. And I want you in my life. How many of us really come down and say, even when I walk out those doors, my life is in your hands. Maybe you're a believer that kind of walked away from God. Maybe you're somebody that has been struggling with this because you got a lot of people that tell you God's not real did you hear how many people said they believed what Jesus had been doing but they convinced them to kill Jesus anyway the people that were screaming crucify him were the same people that were probably healed by him <laughs> don't let your friends or family or anybody sway you to go a different direction you have seen the evidence what will you do with Jesus Christ